All right. All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to day two. Uh, my name is Alyssa. I am part of the World Movement for Democracy team, and I have a couple of housekeeping notes this morning before we get started on the panel. Um, so could I get everyone's attention real quick just before we begin? The first housekeeping note for today is just want to remind everyone to please return your interpretation devices at the end of every evening and then you can get a new one the next day. Um, we also have a lost and found, so if you think you've lost something, please come find a member of uh, the NED staff outside of the Swan Room. Uh, cash allowances uh, for folks that are cost covered are in the Peacock Room. Uh, you know, finally, or turn on your app notifications. We are sending updates throughout the day, and make sure you check your messages as well. And finally, uh, on Democracy Lounges today, so yesterday we all saw and experienced the importance of culture and art and music, and we're continuing that theme with two of our Democracy Lounges as well. So at 1545, our partner Garden of Hope will demonstrate how they convey gender issues in Taiwan through theater. And at 1600, you know, please come by and stop and chat with Amal, um, Abjur Amal, uh, to hear the untold stories from Iraq through the medium of poetry. And now we'll be turning it over to our morning panel discussion. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this morning's session. My name is Kathy Tai, Deputy Regional Director for Asia and Pacific Program at Center for International Private Enterprise. As a native of Taiwan, I personally have benefited so much from democracy and market economy here in Taiwan. These are foundation for prosperity and continuous opportunities for local people. And SIPE, SIPE's work is a validation of that. So today, I'm very happy to welcome SIPE's Executive Director, Andrew Wilson, for some remarks. Well, thank you, good morning, and welcome, and it's my pleasure to be with all of you here today. You know, if, if you're looking for new ways to defend democracy in a large civic space, you're in the right place this morning. We have the privilege of opening day two of the assembly with a panel discussion on alliances to enlarge civic space, how do business and civil society combine forces. SIPE is the business institute within the NED family of institutions. We bring a private sector perspective to the assembly along with our partners from the Free Enterprise and Democracy Network. We welcome the opportunity to converse with our friends and colleagues from civil society in the wider democracy community, and I'd like to thank the NED for giving us this opportunity this morning. The premise of this session today is that business and civil society must, must work together to counter authoritarian threats and specifically to preserve civic rights of freedom of association, freedom of expression, and others. Collective action across sectors of society is a powerful antidote to authoritarian tactics of playing one constituency against another. I remember at the Dakar Assembly, we had another business and civil society panel called for, that called for building trust across these sectors, linking their respective dialogue initiatives and forming new alliances. Those are good recommendations that they made. But how does one go about actually doing this? Such collaboration really is, is still new territory for many of us. And the task of our panelists is to shed light on different mo modes of co collaboration. For those of you who may be wondering where business fits in the democracy community, this question goes back to the founding of SIPE in 1983. The fact is that business has a stake in an open, well-governed society, and, and independent business acts as a counterweight to the state. Its talent, resources, and constituencies make the private sector a potentially valuable ally to civil society. Moreover, open market economies based on individual liberty, rule of law, and a quality of opportunity serve to foster pluralistic societies and accountable government. We like to say 
that business needs democracy, and democracy needs business to thrive. I was at a, 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 a meeting with President Tsai earlier in the week, and she, she made the observation that Taiwan's own semiconductor industry, its great success story of global commerce, could only have happened in a democracy because democracies provide the freedom of thought and innovation and ability to maneuver that, some, so that very complex industries like semiconductors need to, to thrive. And I agreed with her 100%. Taiwan is a perfect example of how democracies and business uh, and the private sector and economic growth really reinforce each other moving forwards. Forging collaboration is in a large measure, though, an exercise in building trust. Often civil society, civil society does not understand the role of business in democracy. While business can be complacent, blind to the authoritarian dangers ahead, until it too becomes a target of regulatory action and crackdown. Last year, SIPE conducted opinion polls in Tunisia, Ukraine, and Bolivia which examined attitudes towards the private sector, those polls found that the public expected business to take a leadership role in economic recovery, and that business actually enjoyed higher trust than almost any other institution in the country. At the same time, the public expected business to be a better partner with other segments of society. And besides trust, there are practical questions of when collaboration makes sense, where to begin, what methods to use, and so on. We need models for action and skills for sustained cooperation. Fortunately, today, we have a panel of think tank executives and business leaders who can speak to the interaction of civil society and business and some forms of cooperation that are possible. Just to give you a flavor of the possibilities, SIPE has seen cooperation in such areas as grassroots initiative for community development, joint advocacy, youth education, cross-sector funding relationships, public budget monitoring, and efforts for inclusive growth. While there is shared value in these efforts, the question remains of what else must be done to defend civic space. The Free Enterprise and Democracy Network, or FEDIN as we call it, for instance, has called for more proactive monitoring of threats to freedom of association. Collective action on rule of law is another area ripe for cooperation. And I hope to hear of new ventures that you dream up during this assembly. The road ahead is long and time is short, as Maria said yesterday. So let's hear from the panel about how we can all get started on this journey. I'm going to hand it back to Kathy Tai, who are going to introduce our wonderful panel of partners from around the world. Kathy, over to you. So let me say a few words um, to introduce uh, our panelists before we start. Um, so first, I would like to introduce um, Mr. Wojciech Szybowski. He's a political analyst, leading strategic foresight in CEE on Europe Affairs. He's currently the editor-in-chief of Visigar Insight and president of the Respublica Foundation. He's also the founder of the New Europe 100 network of digital age leaders from Europe and Eastern Europe. Second, I would like to introduce uh, Uni. Uni is the manager of the public finance unit at Ideas, Malaysia's think tank that aims to improve the level of understanding and acceptance of public policies based on the principles of the rule of law, limited government, competitive market, and free individuals. At Ideas, she leads and manages research and advocacy projects on government procurement reform, budget transparency, state-owned enterprises, and the governance of major infrastructure projects in ASEAN. And next, uh, Toki. Uh, Ms. Toki is a business development consultant interested in the growth and development of small and medium enterprises. She's vice chair Africa for the World Chamber Federation, immediate past president of the Lagos Chamber of Commerce and Industry, and the national vice president of the National Association of Chambers of Commerce and Industry, Mines and Agriculture, NASIMA. She currently sits on the board of a number of organizations, including Youth Enterprise Development NGO and a coalition of women business association in Nigeria. Last but not least, Katch. She is governance relations expert working at the intersection of business and national development. Currently leads work on Makati Business Club's governance program, including meetings with cabinet secretaries, leaders in Congress, and key Metro Manila mayors. She also supervises projects on digital cities and government transparency. So welcome everyone. 
So as Andrew said, today this panel is to uh, explore the possibilities for collaboration and to find common ground between the private sector and civil society. And so um, I would like to start the conversation by um, asking um, each panelist to share a little bit on why collaboration between private, private sector and business is so important, and what are the ways for them to work together? So maybe we can start with uh, Catch. Sure, at Makati Business Club, we really think that uh, working with the civil society is one way that we can help push our common advocacies. So we have three models of working with uh, civil society. We support them with concrete uh, resources. We work with them to push advocacies on government transparency, and also we do knowledge sharing. So on the first point, supporting with resources, we work with internews on the Ads for News project where we pitch our members to transfer two million of their ad spending budget towards local news organizations instead of social media on, um, on knowledge sharing and on supporting them with uh, common advocacies. We work with the Right to Know Right Now coalition. We've worked with them for the past 30 years and this coalition is made up of labor leaders, made up of climate activists. Uh, we may agree on no other issue, but we both agree and everybody in that coalition agrees that freedom of information is a good thing. And on the last point, we also join all of their forums. Uh, they invite us to, uh, we also do trainings for them. We use our network of business leaders to support civil society. That's a great point. Like when you talk about ads for news, basically if you want to change the behavior of the private sector or the business, how to really think about the incentives? How do you change the incentives so then that leads to behavior change is a great point. So maybe we can come back to explore that point later. So um, Toki, uh, maybe you can share a little bit about your experience in Nigeria. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Kathy. Um, in, in my environment, we have had a history of moving very quickly from colonial rule to military rule. And so there's a lot of distrust, and it's mutual distrust, between private sector and civil society. And the outcome of that is that civil society have sort of gained a reputation as um, activists and rebels. And when you have a situation where the shrinking of civil space is actually done by government itself, where government is the largest spender um, of monies. You have a situation where, where private sector is concerned, there are fears around loss of revenue, there are fears about being frontal and antagonistic um, with government. Um, civil society seems, on the other hand, to lack an understanding of what the challenges of private sector um, is. And so with us, it's a very fragile um, sort of situation, um, looking for and finding ways to collaborate. However, COVID sort of changed all of that because all of a sudden, um, what was going on affected everyone and it didn't matter what sector. Um, you were in, and so we found that where it concerned health, where it concerned education, there was quite a lot of collaboration going on between um, civil society and, and private sector. And so I, I do happen to sit on the board of trustees of an, a youth-focused, youth-managed, youth-driven NGO that we started in 2019, known as Lagos Island Connect. And the thought behind this was, here's a huge demographic, very important to private sector, very important to the growth of the country, and a very important political demographic. And we sort of thought that if we turned everyone's attention outwards into this demographic, maybe we could sort of find a new model by which we could collaborate. And so with Lagos Island Connect, we have stakeholders from civil society, we have private sector providing resources, we have youth at the heart of what we do, and we also have partnerships with the state government. Um, we're just three years down the road, um, COVID slowed things down a little bit, but it's been a good experience. Mm -hmm. um, it's one that we're hoping will be replicated across the country, 
And that, that is one of the models that seems to be quite unique and seems to be working for us. Having this common interest in which all of you would want to collaborate and, and, and invest in. It's wonderful that you talk about just, uh, you know, kind of the, the different perceptions from the private sector and civil society and how that could actually be the, like, you know, the, the barriers for initial, like, initial conversation and outreach. But COVID, you know, changed that. So that, that's an example that really shows the, the solidarities you know, in difficult times and how everyone should really stand together and then uh, you know, advance the common goal. So that is a great example. Um, Uni, uh, in the case of uh, ideas, I know you have done quite a bit to uh, reach out to the private sector, try to form partnerships. So maybe you can share a little bit of your thought on this. Thank you, Kathy. I, and I, I'm glad that Toki mentions about this sort of different perspective in between these two actors, right? Where business sees civil society as nuisance, you know, rebels uh, protesting all the times, not knowing the context, while civil society sees private sectors as piggybacking governments, wanting uh, free, uh, free things from the government all the time. So there are very different per sort of per perceptions in between these two actors. And I think what we do in Ideas, we try to provide platform for these two different points of view to sit together and see whether there's some, some sort of, yeah, the same issue that we can, we can work together. And I think one of the uh, catalysts, I think in the case of Nigeria, would be COVID. For us, it's a huge scandal that I think everyone in this room now, which is 1MDB. And these big uh, corruption issues affect the whole country because uh, political corruption is at the root. And many, and it then exposes how bad the political corruption is in Malaysia. And, and for us to see there is a need for regulating political financing. While we are doing this, we, we, we try, in, in ideas, we try to develop these legislations on political financing. I think one of the cor cornerstone is transparency. Mm -hmm. But then there is a fear among the you know, private sectors. If our names are going to be exposed mm -hmm. there, mm -hmm. my chances of getting government contracts mm -hmm. will be re reduced. So I think for, from, for civil society, it's, we long have been advocating for transparency without knowing that there might, may be some negative implication for private sectors. So I think creating this communication in between is very important. Another, another issue that we work on is uh, BRI, a Belt and Road Monitor. And I think uh, Ideas has been pointing out the, the lack of governance framework for procurement for state-owned enterprises which make Chinese capital, which already destructive in the first place, become even more destructive because we don't have that governance framework. Mm -hmm. And we figure out that one of the problems is then it affecting local contractors. It has SMEs, right? The, the small, medium enterprises. They are affected because uh, not only, of course, they are at some point being included in the contracts, but then they lost workforce. So I went to one of the states, uh, I think last week, and talked to some contractors, and they say, you know, the Chinese companies pay better wages than us. If they go, you know, we have to pay the same thing, and we cannot compete. So I think this is something that I wouldn't know if then we don't have this interaction between civil society and businesses. So I think for me, why collaborate is because we, we can get a different, different point of view that may, maybe as a civil society, we, we actually didn't have that view before. A second one, just, just another minute, is actually, uh, that's what the benefit of us engaging the, civil, the, the private sectors. For, for private sector engaging us, is to actually using us as to, to aggregate their views. In, in countries like Malaysia where uh, different political opinions sometimes harmful, it may not get you jail, or well, sometimes jail, but many times is you lost the opportunities for contracts or you're being sidelined uh, by government. They cannot speak up. So civil society actually can provide that platform where they can safely say whatever they like in our forum 
we always said, you know, it's a, it's a Chatham house rule. We won't tell you who, who coming here, but we know what your grievances. And then as a civil society, we have that platform to air out whatever grievances from private sectors safely, even to the government. So thanks. Thank you so much, Uni. Uh, Bocek, before we continue, I would like to acknowledge, um, it's really our honor to acknowledge the presence of this special guest. Um, uh, Taiwan's uh, Digital Minister, Audrey Tan, uh, is here with us. Audrey is Taiwan's digital minister um, in charge of social innovation. She led the Taiwan's uh, first e-rulemaking uh, project. She also actively contributes to GovZero, um, a vibrant community in Taiwan focused on creating digital tools for civil society. Thank you so much, Audrey, for your presence. Um, so we now uh, continue our conversation with Vocek. Uh, so maybe you can share a little bit like how your organization or how your work, you know, from the civil society's perspective have contributed to the collaboration of um, partnership with the private sector. Sure, I'm happy to mention that also, but let me shed a light in a, in a broader perspective. I come from Poland, um, a country um, that has uh, experienced tremendous growth over the past 30 years. That the foundations of which were laid by a unique collaboration, uh, you wouldn't say of entrepreneurs or business, but of workers and the unions, with the civil society, which at that time were lawyers and journalists, um, that transgressed this space and built together uh, the great solidarity movement. Well, that, was, that started some 40 years ago, and, um, and that brought about major change and transformation uh, uh, highly support, supported and um, assisted by the National Endowment for Democracy, among others. And these 30 years of prosperity within this space, uh, we've seen um, uh, not only democracy grow, but uh, especially uh, undisturbed, nearly undisturbed uh, period of prosperity in which businesses thrive and uh, entrepreneurs have grown perhaps from workers uh, to micro uh, companies mostly, and now majority of the population in Poland is, uh, is uh, employed or self-employed through as micro entrepreneurs. And in this very context, uh, Poland has been in the recent uh, months uh, the country that was the country of, of refuge for, for people crossing over from Ukraine, worn, torn, Ukraine. And in that space, that particular space, I wanted to talk about uh, how this business and civil society collaboration is materializing today, which is, uh, I believe, quite a unique story and uh, a learning experience. So just to give you a, a, a numbers, uh, in a country of 40 million, we had 7 million people crossing the border of Ukraine in the recent months since the beginning of the war in Ukraine. Uh, some 53% 50, uh, of businesses in Poland, uh, entrepreneurs, got engaged in assisting uh, refugees in different ways. Uh, that, uh, that num these numbers were higher among uh, bigger companies. The bigger ca uh, companies accounted for about 86% of bigger companies, uh, larger enterprises in Poland. Uh, been engaged in assisting refugees in Poland in various ways, and I'll go later uh, in, in our discussion how, how it happened. There were about 40% of micro-entrepreneurs, so those who basically nearly make their li living by, by being entrepreneurial and uh, self-made men in, in this business environment, and they still uh, brought some assistance, 40% of that um, business owners. And what is most interesting and where I want to build on uh, a little bit further and elaborate uh, a little bit further in the discussion is what, what we also put emphasis and, and invest our work uh, as a think tank um, and a, a main media platform is that 17% of all businesses got engaged in direct support uh, by giving out their own goods or investing their own services in assistance. 
just, just imagine, 7 million people crossing over to a 40 million country, and you don't necessarily see any uh, refugee camps or, um, you know, uh, isolated um, settlements uh, of those people. People were, were welcomed at homes, but mostly people were welcomed in differently appropriated business, um, uh, the, how to say, mobilities, the offices, hotels, most of hotels, uh, most of office space that were on the, on the route of, of those people who were coming to Poland uh, uh, were made available and, and businesses didn't care that much uh, for the first, at least for the first months until summer, what, uh, you know, how to earn money, but how they were caring how to assist uh, those people who are coming. So I think uh, there is a story to be told and I'm happy to discuss it uh, today how uh, about 300 uh, entrepreneurs uh, created essentially a WhatsApp group out of not having any sort of established organization uh, to conduct business um, or uh, yeah, business uh, philanthropy or venture philanthropy. And they managed to organize large parts of shipments. Uh, they managed to uh, bring about, for instance, by May, 34 wagons of train with half a million ton of goods uh, to war and torn Ukraine, just of their own uh, belief that out uh, of having so many decades of being um, enjoying prosperity, but also being assisted to develop that prosperity, it's time to give back. And the big question of today and that uh, our organization is invested in, together also with SAIP, is how do you build on that experience? How to make it sustainable? So one of the ways, uh, and I'll stop here with this remark, uh, that we have experimented and, and successfully so, was to establish this informal group of, of people who earlier communicated and just on WhatsApp group and plug them in into United Nations humanitarian uh, response to the refugee UNHRC. Uh, that was perhaps for the first time ever that UNHRC national response plan involved businesses um, to the main stage next, next to civil society in, in order to, to uh, bring together this collaboration together. But the challenges are very similar to what you just said. How do you build interface? How do you, how do you link small grassroots organizations with businesses that essentially are all about scaling up and professionalism to the levels that civil society very often is unprepared for. How do you, uh, how do you make the most of, of the potential and more importantly, how to do you make it sustainable? So I'm happy to discuss it further. This is a very compelling examples that you gave. And then also like through the like, first round of uh, 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 questions and answers, I feel like we've got different models of collaborations, like through you know, information sharing, you know, the, uh, for instance, the media platforms that you have, or through joint advocacy, through um, youth training, through capacity building. So I, I feel like there are a variety of ways for collaboration. So maybe we can go back to uh, catch share some um, models that have been successful in your experiences uh, working with uh, civil society organizations. Sure, Kathy, um, but before that, I just want to point out, or I found it super interesting that among the panelists here, the collaboration between business and civil society stem from some sort of crisis or governance lack. Um, so in our case, uh, Makati Business Club started in the wake of the 1980s dictatorship in the Philippines. So we were started as a way to engage the government uh, when basically the other business associations can't or wouldn't. And it was interesting to see that reflected as well in UNI's experience with IMDB and the general transparency um, crisis that it was causing in Malaysia and also uh, Toki's case of COVID-19 and uh, Wojciech's case of uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine as causing that kind of gelling mechanism. Um, so I think that's an important thing to keep in mind um, that we have common interests. Business and civil society have common interests, and it shouldn't take a crisis for us to realize that. Um, on our points on like really successful models, I want to really cite our work with the Right to Know Right Now Coalition, um, mostly because of its longevity. Uh, I see that others on the panel here, they're very recent initiatives, um, but this initiative has been going on with uh, them for 30 years. 
And I think our main success there has been keeping the whole coalition together, uh, despite our very differing views on other things like labor, other things like uh, environmental support or ESG. Um, one thing that we work with with them is always to create a private caucus. So um, when we were pushing forward the Freedom of Information Bill in the Philippines, uh, we always met with, a pri with civil society beforehand, so civil society and private sector sitting together to discuss our concerns with the bill and what provisions we wanted to forward. The point of this is that so we are able to present a united front uh, when we're already talking to the lawmakers. So it's clear that the support for this bill is coming from all sides. Um, another model that I want to cite for support is actually inspired by Audrey Tang. Uh, we had an event with her last 2020. Um, it's nice to see you in person and not just a little Zoom box. Um, but uh, we worked with uh, the governments, basic, uh, with the local governments in Metro Manila to create ways for them to consult their citizens digitally. So, so much responsibility was delegated to the mayors of Metro Manila during COVID, and um, they, were at, they were scrambling, really, to figure out ways to uh, consult their citizens and to ask if what the, the policies they were implementing at the time were correct. Uh, so, we work with civil society organizations, data analyst organizations, um, church groups, activist groups, uh, to help create like, a mechanism for the government to consult them on any new like quarantine restrictions or any new COVID-related transport policies that they might push forward. Sorry, turning to the rest of the panel now. Thank you, so <laughs> Thank you Katch. I really like your comments on why it would take a crisis for us to work together, right? So we should look beyond the crisis time and then really try to find common ground even in normal times. So um, Toki, um, can you share a few words on like successful models? Yeah, I think my, my thoughts around this is that something must kick off a relationship. Um, and um, in my view, um, okay, yes, it's taken a crisis to start it off, but then how do we sustain it? Yeah. The point is we now have an opportunity to experience each other. And through experiencing each other, begin to have agreements around exactly what we want to collaborate on and what is the way forward. In terms of my experience and our experience in Nigeria, like I said, it's been fragile. And it's been um, around, so for example, some civil society organizations have a good relationship with some media organizations. Certainly not the government-owned media organizations, usually the private-owned media organizations. And even they have to be careful about what they publish. Um, there have been collaboration around legal services um, which are services that the CSO really and truly require, um, especially when they get into trouble with government. So you find um, lawyers like the Bar Association um, offering uh, free services. So we did have, a, we did have an incident um, in Nigeria shortly after Black Lives Matter in the US, uh, which is called NSARS. And it was an uprising by the youth against the law enforcement agencies um, of the country. And you found the Nigerian Bar Association offering their services completely free of charge across the country uh, to, help, to help the youth. Then, of course, we've had it around um, um, education. Um, and when I say education, I really mean civic and voters' education. Because part of what is happening at the project that I mentioned, it's, it's actually an attempt to look beyond crisis. Um, the idea itself did not come from a crisis. It happened before the crisis, but COVID helped it, helped it along, you know. Um, and we're looking to co-create now. So we're co-creating with government on one side, with private sector, and with the youth themselves, um, drawing up annual plans, um, thinking of what it is that will, that will benefit um, the youth going forward. Um, and then there's the big hole around um, academia, uh, the necessity for think tanks and uh, research work, um, data uh, and information. Um, so there are some one-offs that are going on between private universities and CSO as well. So you know there is such a scope, such a huge scope for collaboration between CSOs and um, and private sector. And, and it really benefits um, both sides 
um, to collaborate. We've seen it, it's been demonstrated um, for us, at least in the last few years, we've seen what, what it can do, it's enormous. Uh, private sector obviously has the resources um, that are required um, to, to, to get things done and to meet objectives. But you know, on the other hand, CSOs need to begin to understand business. Um, they're very passionate. Um, um, it's all about, you know what, I'm ready to die over this matter. Business is not ready to die over anything because they really need the revenues coming in. So we need to find that common, that space of common agreement, you know, where we begin to be a lot more strategic. I think it's all about strategy, about our partnerships. Thank you. Thank you so much, Toki. Um, I like the key word of uh, co-creation. Um, and so um, how do we co-create something that's sustainable and then long term? I think that's really important. Um, I do want to remind the audience that uh, we will open up uh, for um, Q&A time um, after a round of uh, um, questions and um, answers. So um, prepare your questions. If you have any questions you wanted to ask, uh, we will give you time. Um, so next, uh, let's go to um, Uni to share some models <laughs> with us. Uh, in the area of governance, uh, civic space, improving democratic institutions, as I, I said earlier, I think we are still in that early stage. Uh, I think many organizations, including IDEAS, is sort of experience uh, trying different models. We have this coalition, we call it and Raswa Busters. Raswa means corruptions in Malaysia. Uh, there's a media organization there, there's an uh, owner of, uh, I think, executive from oil company. So we, we tried to discuss there, but it's still very early stage. But I think one of the models that actually, that quite established in Malaysia probably for other topics, for example, um, vulnerable communities. I think there's a lot of collaboration in between private sectors and civil societies in that regard. For example, our work ideas uh, with uh, Orang Asli, which is the aborigines of, of Malaysians. Uh, they are uh, sometimes a group that are quite sidelines in the development because of the way they, they, their way of life. So ideas and other civil society organization work with um, companies like Saim Dhabi, Petronas, try to understand and, and figure out like what are missing in the policies and uh, intervention done by the government and, uh, and also uh, private sectors because they've been doing a lot mm -hmm. for, for the aborigines, right, for the Orang Asli in the past so many years. What was missing from this? I think so the conversation, uh, consolidating, aggregating all these efforts, we need to do this. We need to sit together so that our intervention will mm -hmm. not be patchy and, and we can collaborate. And in that conversation, we need to also include the Orang Asli themselves because they are the one who you know, who knows the problem. We, we're not coming to, to tell what to do, but we are here to facilitate. So I think that model, we are trying that now, but not so much in, of course, civic space or governance. But I think we are hoping by giving space to the most vulnerable communities, a community in our, in our society, which is Orang Asli, will provide that greater civic space. It's not necessarily on, you know, freedom of association, but I think that kind of collaboration we are hoping to, to continue in other areas as well. So that's, I think, one of the models that we are trying to do. Very, very well. Uh, Wojciech? Sustainability. Um, yeah, uh, we, we hear often from, from colleagues from the United States that, that come to, to Poland and they call us, uh, as Poland, uh, the, the biggest NGO in the world or humanitarian superpower because of the just because of the facts that I have just presented to you. But I think what should be recognized is it's not only Poland, it's Slovakia and Czech Republic, to some extent also Hungarian society react in the same way. Why I'm saying that, um, these countries have been recipients of refugees and the businesses are, are also involved there. The way for sustainability, at least the way we see it and towards which goal we are working um, in my organization together with those businesses is to establish a central European uh, network collaboration of those, who, of those who actually want to look beyond. By now, we are already in autumn, so six months into this situation, six months into the crisis, uh, businesses have almost uh, lost their steam. Uh, in terms of how much more they can sustain this uh, support. So this beautiful story 
hopefully it's not coming to an end, but definitely has a, um, has a, a moment, if not of pause, then, then a difficult moment currently. One of the reasons is, of course, that there is no government assistance. The government did not plan any, make any contingency plans or didn't plan for collaboration for make this effort sustainable on the longer, um, on the longer run. But the promise is there um, that's, uh, for, for the businesses, at least those who are engaged, that um, they know that by themselves, many entrepreneurs establish their own foundations, they're not going to make a big difference. But if they come together, uh, they may see that when some of them you know, fall short of, of the resources they have, the others may be still uh, pushing the cart together. And overall, by establishing something bigger, they, uh, they achieve much greater goals. So the big promise is in one, on one side in collaboration, and that will be my main point. Our proposal, in fact, is to establish Central Eastern European Solidarity Trust based on, on of these businesses that engage in venture philanthropy, in business philanthropy. And it's a completely new concept in Central Eastern Europe to do it from within, rather to be, beneficent, uh, be beneficiaries of, of the assistance from outside. And I believe that is possible. This is maybe actually being done. Second thing for sustainability that we can see is uh, happening is actually digital. One of the the first steps that businesses go, uh, you know, re reach out to civil society is how do we build this interface? And what businesses are usually better at, although civil society have been engaged in the digital toolbox as well, is actually scaling up on the basis of uh, information exchange, digital, um, uh, essentially marketing uh, um, and, and management. And currently there is on the basis of civil society initial mapping, uh, service mapping uh, exercises that have been carried out, there is an effort with major businesses from consultancy and also global uh, companies that uh, provide free software or IT specialist building up, trying to scale up the service mapping that is just local, localized, to make it much bigger. And why I believe it's sustainable? Because businesses look at it on, as a two-way uh, win. On one hand, to deliver immediate relief and support to civil society. In the longer run, this is creating a market. This is, this is, about, this is about scaling up good cause, which is, is building up, of course, democratic uh, environment, but it's also expanding the market potential. And for businesses, the engagement in civil society of that scale, uh, at least in Poland, but I believe in other, uh, in other countries, it, it, it has a similar logic. It's a business opportunity. So it, there, is a, there is a promise, but this promise may be fulfilled only when, when actually this, uh, this works out on, on this next level. Yeah, and maybe that's I stop a, here. That's great. Some um, really interesting insight for us to continue to think about sustainability. How do we sustain the, the, the collaboration uh, across different sectors? So now I would like to uh, open the floor um, and then welcome the audience to ask questions. And uh, if I may ask uh, to identify yourself first and then so people know who you are, where you're from, and then ask your question. Um, thank you in advance for that. As I see a couple of hands, um, so um, if Someone can help um, pass the mic. Uh, this one first, and then uh, Mr. Hideki, and then that one. Hello, uh, my name is Mart uh, from Greenhost, um, a small business in uh, the Netherlands, and I'm based in Taipei. Um, my question is, what do you think of new uh, business models? Um, uh, business ownership. Um, so one of the things we are looking into is uh, um, uh, strategic ownership, where, uh, sorry, uh, steward ownership, where there's a uh, separation between uh, financial ownership and decision making, um, which um, maybe can guard the, the ideologies of a company and the decision making towards uh, supporting civil society and other things. Uh, and it's not only about profit anymore. Uh, is that something which is interesting, in your opinion, um, as a new future model for businesses? Thank you very much for your question, Mr. Hideki. 
Uh, thank you very much, Kathy. Uh, my name is Hideki Wakabayashi from uh, Japan Think Lobby, a newly founded uh, think tank in Japan, working on the, uh, democracy, human rights, including business human rights and civic space in Asia. So I, my question is, uh, I was a little bit surprised that nobody has touched upon the business and human rights, business and human rights due diligence process, because guiding principle agreed by the United Nations has already included the engagement, stakeholder engagement, including a civil society. So this is kind of powerful initiative. It's core value that you can business sectors and stakeholders, uh, uh, civil society and other uh, stakeholders can engage in, talk about human rights and peace and the kind of human rights due diligence process. I think why not <laughs> work on the, this business human rights due diligence process in the entire world to connect each other, work on the business and democracy issues. So I would like to see how you see this uh, issue. Great question. Thank you very much. And that gentleman there. Good morning. My name is Joshua Mata. I'm from the Philippines. I work with the trade unions in the Philippines for, for a long, long time. Well, I actually agree that businesses should play a, you know, a big role in uh, advancing and deepening democracy in any country. And, and, I, and, and I'd like to pick up from what Mr. Hideki had just said. You know, I, I, I think one of the biggest problems, at least in my experience, one of the biggest problems back home is the fact that many businesses, with due respect to Makati Business Club, many businesses are actually not able, uh, we are not able to hold to account many businesses for their, for their human rights violations. So in that sense, why don't we step a bit further? Why don't we all both work together, the labor movement and business, to come up with a legally binding instrument that we have been trying to push for in the United Nations Human Rights Council for many years? I'd like to hear the opinion of, of the panelists. What do they think about a legally binding instrument for transnational corporations? Thank you. Um, and then this gentleman here. So we'll come by all the questions um, because we don't have that much time. So we'll come by all the questions and then ask the panelists to respond um, all at once. This um, gentleman here. Thank you to all the panelists. Uh, my name is Parsifal de Sola. I am the head of the China Latin America Research Center of the Andres Bello Foundation in Bogota. You've all stressed a lot of points uh, about the private sector. Private sector is quite, quite broad. Within the private sector, uh, have you seen, where do you see the most potential? Are there any uh, particular sectors of the private community that are more prone to the kind of activities that you mentioned? And again, which are the ones that you see more skeptical in actually engaging in these types of activities. Thanks. Thank you all for these great questions. And then so if I can just ask the panelists to try to respond the questions to uh, the best you can. I mean, these are fantastic questions, but they're also tough questions. So that I'm really happy the organizer gave us this opportunity to start the conversation, right? To really explore ways um, and then to identify what are the key ingredients for successful partnership between the private sector and civil society, right? So that's what we try to find out today. So, um, you know, with all that questions, if you can also um, just uh, um, finish up with kind of your final comment um, for this panel, like what are the key success lesson learned, uh, um, key lesson learned for your success? Um, that would be great. Would it be, um, you know, uh, framing? Uh, of the issue, how do you, you know, communicate with uh, the private sector in the language and then the, 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 the framing, the terms that they could understand, they could uh, accept, uh, or, or what, or maybe some other tips. So um, if I can also start with Catch. Sure. Uh, okay, let me just go over that very quickly. I think the three questions that we have today, they revolve around one issue, which is that business does not exist in a vacuum. So there's been recent uh, developments. People are starting to understand more that you cannot do business when the world is on fire. Um, you cannot do business when everybody is sick. So there's more and more realization that business does not exist in a vacuum. We live in a society. 
And in order for us to thrive, we also need to support that society. Um, that's, that's my key takeaway, I guess, in dealing with business. Um, answering the last question first, areas of cooperation. I think in this panel, I wouldn't say there's a specific sector of the, of the business that's more prone to cooperation. I would say it's more on specific issues. Um, so like in Uni's example, when it comes to corruption, that's an issue for everybody. It's an issue for the private sector. It's also an issue for business. Um, when it comes to kind of governance gaps like COVID, like the Russian invasion, um, that's an issue for everybody. It's all encompassing. Um, so I wouldn't say it's a specific part of the private sector, but rather uh, the issues that you can look at and focus on. On uh, Wakabayashi-san's point and um, uh, the gentleman from the Philippines' point, um, so business and human rights is a key and important issue that we're trying to deal with in the Philippines. So Makati Business Club, we actually support the Commission on Human Rights in uh, formulating their national action plan. Um, so I was telling Wakabayashi-san yesterday that we hope that, we do, that they do move forward with this and that they submit it uh, to the UN soon. Um, but yes, that's definitely something that we're open to exploring with you. Um, this may take different models. Definitely, um, we'll need to work out exactly how we'll cooperate, um, but we're welcome to exploring it with you. Yeah, so I guess last words. Um, business and civil society have such large uh, ways to cooperate. We have a lot of common ground and I hope that we can all turn our creativity and all of our like innovative energies towards finding those spaces so that we can all push forward the advocacies that are important to us as business and as civil society. Thank you, Katch. Toki? Um, that was a great start that Katch gave to this and you're absolutely right. Um, I think we're all in a learning process. Even individually, we've all learned something from COVID. Mm -hmm. Things are being done differently. Um, we're all charting new paths to follow. I think in terms about the question uh, between um, the model that you were talking about, currently, at least in my country, you have it being practiced in the sense that you have non-government organizations having um, setting up in a way that they have um, a revenue generating or activity or arm or project or subsidiary because they need the financial resources to do what they need to do in their civil engagements. And then they have the whole part around um, governance. Whether it's a model that would have appeal to private sector. I'm not sure because private sector is really, really about business. I mean, now the world is pushing a lot around um, CSR and what you're giving back to community, what you're doing about your environment, what you're doing about labor. So I think it's, it's, it's a conversation um, that, that we need to push forward on. Um, in terms of legislation, honestly, not everything can be legislated. Um, you really do need a um, common agreement and a common push towards certain uh, objectives. Otherwise, we would all have been legislated into doing all kinds of things. Um, so I think um, in terms of the um, human rights is embedded in a lot of our various laws. Um, it's not all in one document. You have bills of rights um, depending on whether you're looking at labor, business sectors. Um, and, I, and I think it's just a common conversation. We have to have a vision um, as, as people, as nations, as uh, sectors of society on how we, we pursue um, the common good. Um, is, is what we're thinking about. Um, and, and I think in terms of um, last words, um, I think this is the beginning. I think we all should be leaving this conference um, further motivated and determined um, to find more areas of collaboration and agreement. I, I mean, that's how I feel. And, and, and begin to, you know, talk, walk that talk. And, and um, there's absolutely, it's not, it's a no-brainer that private sector and CSO should and must collaborate if we want to achieve scale, if we want to achieve impact, if we want to achieve reach. Um, I think those are my last words. Thank you, Kathy. That's great. Last word. Uh, Uni? I just want to comment on the, the model of corporations where, you know, the financial part and the other parts are separate. I'm not sure that's manageable which also means that the, the other parts, we always go haywire, do whatever they like, right? Uh, and the other one, like, then turn into NGO instead of changing 
things within. I'm not sure how that, that, does that work. At the end of the day, uh, the responsibilities of governance, um, performance of a company, I think it stays on, on the board and shareholders. And shareholders, actually, well, if many of you owning shares here, it's, it's our responsibility to ensure that our investment actually go to the right thing. Companies going somewhere, it's, it's their company, but we are, as shareholders, have also right to determine where the directions of this company are going. So I think it's important, that's why growing the business to be big and become public, publicly listed and they subject to greater discipline is very important. Because when you're small, usually SMEs, at least in the case of Malaysia, they don't really subject to many disciplines. They don't publish annual report. We don't know what's happening, you know, being used for political reasons. Uh, so, but if they are publicly listed, they have become bigger. Of course, not, not all companies are meant to be big, but the likelihood of them subjected to greater disciplines, even on human rights, uh, is greater. And I think it's, it's, the, it's the obligation of shareholders uh, to actually ensure that. On human rights, I think I, I agree with Toki. Uh, as much as we want to have a very like, uniform standard to subject companies. At the end of the day, UN declarations of human rights, for example, it's subject to countries, not companies. But these principles can be adopted in, in any standards that, that countries can create it. I mean, EITI, for example, uh, cost. I believe those standards on extractive industries, on construction industry, incorporate some of the human rights ideas. Mm -hmm. I mean, in Malaysia, palm oil is is a controversial, and we are working with, with one of them, Saim Darby, um, and, and palm oil in Malaysia is, is no secret. They have foreign labor problem, they subject their labors to very low standards, and we, there's a tough glove, for example, it's very important business in Malaysia. Uh, they have really good anti-corruption, but at the same time, they also have lower standards. But I think, in our opinion, if we start, uh, making them enemies, the conversation will not go anywhere. So I believe, I, I think I like Toki's um, point, is engagement. Maybe we come to engage from different uh, sectors or from different issues. Say, for example, in the case of Saib Darby, we come from Orang Asli. But it is also possible through this long engagement that we can communicate the importance of including human rights principles in this. It's a long journey. <laughs> it will not happen in one or two years. But I think that's what it takes for, for a change to happen. So, thank you. Thank you, Uni. Or Jack? Oh, it's taking a long time for you. No, no, no. Uh, thank you. I, I, I think I, I have little to add, but I'll start where, where Toki mentioned that this co cooperation is no-brainer. And I would add, yes, and we should not take it for granted. It's, it's something to be earned and to be fought for. Um, it takes time and effort especially when governments don't provide a framework for that cooperation. Mm. And that is still uh, um, so, so needed. And I think businesses are becoming aware of that, especially those that, that have agency, referring to the last question. The, uh, the businesses that get engaged and how, how they get engaged are the businesses that feel they have some agency that usually comes with more naturally with being placed, being kind of grown out of, of the place where they operate, rather than being these multinational or dislocated companies. There is, of course, an answer to that, how to get the multinational or big companies, very successful companies engaged, and there are the frameworks of human rights, but I think companies prefer something more specific, and today we're having, we didn't mention the ESG or ESGT even discussion on environments, uh, society, governance, uh, and technology as aspects of the business's responsibility for the environment they co-create. And my last point, probably uh, not answering all, all, the, all the questions, but they've been addressed already by my fa fantastic co-panelists, is that business, for business, uh, business needs some rules. Need, not, not too many rules, but business needs rules, needs framework in which they can plan, operate, and thrive. And interestingly enough, I think they're now seeing, more often than not, the civil society are the guardians and fighters for the rules. Uh, 
And to make, making this alliance or making this transgression sometimes creates the greatest and the most, uh, the, the utmost outputs that were never expected before. And I think these cases that we've been providing, including the one in which collaboration happens with businesses and society in the refugee response in Poland and Central Europe, but also so many others, provide the testimony to that. That there is a space to explore, not taken for granted, but absolutely no brainer. Thank you. Thank you, Wojciech. I think today's panelists all share great insights about like how to work together uh, with uh, civil society organizations. And I think this goes back to kind of uh, uh, the very beginning of um, you know what SIPE stands for or what democracy organization stands for. It's like to make democracy delivers. So to make democracy delivers, you need the private sector's participation into the whole process. And a functional market economy then reinforce and solidify democracy. So then they're intertwined. It's a, it's a symbolic um, relationship. And um, I think as a true believer of that, you know, growing up in Taiwan, I think Taiwan is a successful example of that. And as many examples that panelists have shared today. And so um, I left um, inspired by all the great works uh, that uh, the, the panelists have shared. But I think we also highlighted a few kind of entry point for us to start uh, the conversation, to start the engagement then you know, we can then uh, form the collaboration later on. So I think as uh, the DACA assembly um, indicated or um, uh, discussed um, that um, the cross-sectoral engagement and collaboration really is key to advance democracy around the world. And that's why we are all here talking about this particular issue. And so, um, and I really appreciate um, all the questions from the audience. So, uh, SIPE is here, our panelists are here. So, if after the forum you would like to discuss, brainstorm, find ways to collaborate and uh, to really do more together, to join forces and to really fight for democracy around the world, we're happy, you know, to really work with you um, anywhere. Um, so, fighting for democracy, right? Uh, so that's why we're all here. Um, so thank you all very much uh, for um, joining us today for the great discussion. Thank you again for the panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Alia Ibrahim. I am co-founder of uh, a Beirut-based independent media named Daraj. Uh, when five years ago my co-founders and myself decided to launch this, uh, this media uh, owned by journalists addressing Arabic speakers around the world, we were told by everybody we knew that we were completely crazy. Uh, this was the moment when the Arab Spring had derailed completely. It had turned into the nightmare it had become in Syria and Libya and Yemen and Egypt. And for us, it was the moment where, as journalists, we were feeling we not, not only were not part of the solution, we were part of the problem. And that problem was not in the non-existence of journalists or journalism uh, that believes in the fundamentals of holding power into account, of giving voice for, for marginalized groups. It was in the ownership of the media. So the solution for us was very simple, just work on media owned by journalists. And when people told us we were crazy, we looked for examples, and examples existed. Mediapart and the correspondents were already there. But it was really uh, an, a rappler that, for us, was an incredible inspiration and an incredible validation for our, for our then project. Uh, uh, it was there, it was already doing what we wanted to do on the other side of, of, of the planet, and, and it, uh, 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 it gave us the justification. So I'm saying all this to say how, how important it is for me to be here today with a personal hero and a personal uh, role model and an inspiration. Uh, and <laughs> it, it's, very, it's really very genuine. So thank you to anyone who made that possible. And we have so much to discuss today, just in, 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 in now a little bit less than 30 minutes. So Maria, thank you for being here. It's, it's a great opportunity to be having this conversation here in Taiwan and with everything that is happening around us. Uh, let's go into it. Yesterday you said we're in the last 20 minutes of democracy. 
and previously you said then atomic bomb has hit our information ecosystem. Where do we take it from there? How do we defend journalism? How do we defend this, this industry we love so much uh, and, and push back against everything that's, that's happening? I mean, on all fronts, right? And, and it's the last two minutes. You guys play basketball? Last two minutes, you know, and we are losing this, this game of democracy. So, I mean, part of what we've tried to do in Rappler, first of all, thank you so much. Um, uh, the person who did a lot of the research for, for us, our head of research, Gemma Mendoza, is also here. So, I mean, it's like throwing spaghetti against the wall. You know this. If you're a startup founder, if you're trying to reinvent what civic engagement looks like, what journalism looks like in the age of exponential lies, um, how do we, your question is, so what do we do, right? I mean, let me go directly to what do we do. Yesterday, I talked about um, right before Ann Applebaum told you what the real world looks like, right? How geopolitical power play has shifted to networks. I mean, Belarus, for example, would Belarus be a democracy today if Russia hadn't come in? Yes. Um, would other countries that are on the verge tip towards democracy or autocracy, Inc.? Well, it's still power and money. So. Countries like the Philippines, which is in between, countries in the global south, which are trying to make it work. I mean, it's so interesting what's going on in your country and your own reporting, right? Um, we've, what a long preamble. Why don't I just show you what did work for us? And I'm gonna fast forward through a bunch of this stuff, right? Because in the end, you know, this is what I had actually said. So first of all, let's just go back to this, right? This is the way information operations work. And let's put it in the United States before we bring it back home, because if you are on social media and you're working in a democracy that is slowly tipping, this is happening to you. This is from the Election Integrity Partnership, where you can see how disinformation is seeded and then how it comes bottom up, a lie a million times, and then comes top down. This is stop the steal. This is election fraud. This is happening in Brazil now. And you can look at what the Election Integrity Partnership saw when they looked at the data we stick to evidence-based, fact-based, you actually see that Stop the Steal was seeded a year earlier in August 2019, not surprisingly, in RT. Hmm. And then the mainstreaming began here. Um, again, is it a surprise? It was on Steve Bannon, with Steve Bannon on YouTube, the, the mainstreaming then here, we saw Tucker Carlson bring it out to the super spreaders, QAnon, and then finally, so it comes up this way and then comes top down with then former President Trump saying the same thing and calling people out. And that is what we saw happen. Right? So that's that's so the last two minutes that I that I talked about at the beginning yesterday was really to take what Anne is telling us is happening in the physical world and show you what has happened in the virtual world. And the main problem is that the technology that supposedly connects us, at the time when journalists owned distribution, this could never have happened mm. because we were liable, legally liable for protecting the public sphere. Now, no one is legally liable for protecting this public sphere. And what is the problem? That our minds, what we think of the world, is being insidiously manipulated through our emotions. That's how come social media is now a weapon for information warfare. We talked about this. I mean, Taiwan knows this. Ukraine certainly knows this in 2014. Ukraine started sounding the alarm. The Philippines started sounding the alarm. We tend to always be the testing ground. If the United States is under attack, it comes first through the Philippines. It's now a behavior modification system. You say a lie a million times. It's not a free speech issue, right? Because free speech pounding you to silence We've had both of these attacks happen to us. Uh, and the end goal, like with Crimea, like with Ukraine, is to suppress and then replace. So two step, three step process, suppress, replace, and then mainstream, right? So that's, the, what are the three layers? World War III today is happening, not just the conventional warfare that is happening in Ukraine, that is happening that we, that Taiwan oftentimes prepares for, but it is also an individual war, an individual battle for the truth in each of our minds. That is where this modern war is being fought. So it is first personal, 
It's the impact on you psychologically. This stuff is mildly addictive increased levels of dopamine when you're on it, and the end goal is to keep you scrolling. But when your mind changes, when we are in groups, it becomes sociological. And then, the big thing, we've never had 3.2 billion in one platform. Emergent human behavior with an incentive structure that rewards the liar, that rewards the lies over the truth teller. That's the first part. The second part, why is it the last two minutes in, in this democracy? Because if you don't have integrity of facts, you don't have integrity of elections, right? If you don't know the facts, how are you going to vote for the right person? How are you going to choose? Where is agency? And that's where we are already. We're already at the tail end. And yesterday, I laid out the elections that are there. Some of you guys tweeted. Please use hashtag WM11Assembly. Um, but you tweeted your own elections coming up. Um, so this shift is happening already. It is individual. Uh, I'm, I'm telling you the problem again. L let me spin through all of this stuff. If you want data, go to my Twitter feed because I actually punched out a bunch of data with the hashtag so you can see it. This is the way we began to fight it in Rappler, and it'll be interesting to hear also about the Raj.com. It's a dual funnel. Just like Ann Applebaum told you about the physical world, there is also a virtual world. We only live in one world, and the fact that we have rule of law in the physical world but no rule of law, impunity in the virtual world it is what has caused the erosion of rule of law. But for Rappler, we took it as a dual funnel, right? There's the digital funnel, and then there's the physical civic engagement funnel, and we can talk about that more. This is what we wound up doing. It worked. This is our MVP, not most valuable player, but minimum viable product that I want to push, I want to encourage, our movement to look at and perhaps to set up at a global landscape. Um, only three months in operation, a four-layer pyramid that is a whole of society approach. It starts with 16 news groups. We've never all worked together like this in the Philippines because competition always got in the way. <laughs> well, we did here, and it was a Creative Commons license, so anyone can publish it. And we also had a data layer that went through all of it. Midan, if you're a fact checker, you know that this is a data platform. So every, every one of the 16, like every one of you in the room, tells your followers, tells your community, you know, tell us if you see any lies that you want, fact check, send it here. And when it's sent to that first layer, everyone sees it all the way up to the top layer. And then we meta tag it, right? Then the fact checks go out. Let's say each news group does 30 fact checks a month. That's the supply. The second layer is called the mesh. And this is our way of fighting back now because legislation doesn't really kick in until spring 2023, and then education is like the next generation already coming up. So now, the mesh layer is about 100, more than 100 civil society groups, NGOs, business. For the first time, business came in. Oh my god, I cannot begin to tell you how long it took us to work on that. And then the big thing is the church. Um, and what is the mesh supposed to do? To take those very boring fact checks, because they never spread on social media, and share them with emotion, with a very specific ask from all of us to stay away from anger and hate. And guess, like with Ukraine, like with people who inspire you, inspiration spread as far as anger, hate, and fear. Right, so that's the mesh. And then the third layer was research. Eight research groups with, with the data that we had, and every week they came out with like a webinar that showed you this is who is manipulate, what is the meta-narrative that's being pushed into the public sphere, who is being targeted, who is gaining. It was always inevitably the opposition leader, the vice president, a woman, Lenny Robredo, was always targeted, in fact, since 2016, and who was winning. Marcos, it was very, very interesting. And then finally, but we took it cross-platform, YouTube, Twitter, TikTok, all the way across, because when you have more than one working together with the same data set, you can actually go through. And the last one, layer four, was the most important one, and they were the most adamant. 
they were also the most energized because they hadn't really been fighting for the last six or seven years like mm. the journalists were. The law, the legal groups, law firms, the Philippine Bar Association, the Integrated Bar of the Philippines. In fact, let me show you what that looks up. Oh, sorry, I didn't actually put it in. So the, that law firm, um, all the law firms filed almost, uh, actually they filed more than 21 tactical and strategic cases in less than three months. Movement against disinformation set up by lawyers. It was incredible to try to bring back rule of law. This is the impact. We know it worked. Well, within the first two weeks of doing this pyramid, it's called the facts first pH pyramid, and I, I did the same thing that I'm doing to you. It's like, it is it. This is the last two minutes. This is, the, it's an Avengers assemble moment, right? You have to take all your superpowers, and we did. So look at that. On the left here, you have, this is the main network of the news organizations, but then you put that here, and then you can see the ripple effect. Mm. Um, we mapped the impact, and we've been doing this since 2016, and we have never been able to reclaim the center of our information ecosystem in the Philippines. We did this time. And the first inkling we knew that it was successful was within the first two weeks that we rolled it out, the Philippine government, the Office of the Solicitor General, filed a petition at the Supreme Court against Rappler and the Commission on Elections saying that fact-checking is prior restraint. You're laughing. It is laughable, <laughs> right? But thankfully, the Supreme Court didn't do anything, and we would have kept doing it. Would you have let, like, prior restraint on fact-checking stop you, what does that do, right? These were some, I'll just end with these last two slides, which is the mesh layer, right? They did things like this. They took what the journalists did and they made it accessible. We're kind of boring. <laughs> We're grim and determined oftentimes, right? But look at what they did. Cartoons, artwork, TikTok explainers, I am not on TikTok, but Rappler is, so is. These two are influencers in their own way. One is a, wife, a mother who looks at history. Um, and then the newspapers, our other partners, actually did weekend full page spreads of fact checks and they, their circulation increased. And there was even a billboard. And finally, this is the last thing, you know, like we reversed the research. Because normally, research on disinformation takes forever. By the time it comes out, it's already, it's like, it's like a weapons race, arms race, right? By the time it comes out, it's too late. What we did is we asked them, because they were coming up with the data, we asked them to first publish it before they submit it for peer review. So two of these 20, however many, 21 research reports, are, have, only one has come out after peer review, but they all came out in time for our election. So it is from the bottom up, emotions, intellect, law. That's our whole of society. But, but Maria, you raised so many amazing topics that I would, I would like to ask you about. Sure. But, but I, let's stress on one thing. You did this amazing initiative. At the end of the day, it's a game of time also. And the yes. president won. Yes. We always seem to be five steps behind. Yes. And here there are two main issues. I think that it's brilliant that this retelling stories in, in as many formats as possible to reach as wider audiences as possible is, is incredibly good. But bad news and fake news still flies faster. And, and, and yes. we know that through data. By and design. Algorithms. By design. So what do we do like when, when we're in this ecosystem and we're trying to work on the journalism? And I think one point that needs to be raised here, when, when you as Rappler, as, an, as, as a journalistic uh, priority, when, when journalism is your priority, when you're working so much with civil society, where do you draw the line? Oh, where I love your question. Where do we really stick to the journalism and make sure that even our partners are being held accountable? We always draw the line, and I think that's the difference. The standards and ethics manuals of journalism are very clear, right? We're, so we had a whole discussion about this, but let me quickly say what it is. I no longer have an editorial position in Rappler when I came under attack, because at some point, you know, I, was a, I had 10 arrest warrants in less than two years. Right. This is my 36th year as a journalist, and I have worked for, you know, I spent almost 20 years with CNN International at the golden age of journalism, and, and then headed the largest network in the Philippines. Um, and 
Then we started Rappler. Uh, I could never have thought we would be where we are today. So how do you draw the line? I no longer, well, after the first time I was arrested and they made a point to actually, this is, I remember the date, February 13th, 2019, um, because it was Valentine's Day the next day. So it was my government's gift to me. They made sure to arrest me at five o'clock so that this way uh, I couldn't post bail. I knew, because worst case scenario, that there was a municipal court that was open until nine o'clock, but they delayed it, so I was detained overnight. And when I came out the next morning and I was forced to, you know, the, the arrest warrant didn't even have an amount for bail. That's how much it was rushed. So the next morning, I was, I was furious, but you know, when you're furious, that's when you smile. <laughs> so, so I was furious, and that's when I realized that the pettiness of the way this will work um, that they will bend it to the point law, to the bend, to the point that it's broken, and it's quite petty. So that's when I realized that it isn't, I'm not just a journalist, I'm a citizen. And I am a citizen who is being targeted, and I was gonna hold my government to account. Um, so, uh, to answer your question, how do you draw the line? I do tech data. I take care of our business. The editorial is completely separate. For me, in terms of our civic engagement, um, this goes all the way to the beginning of Rappler in 2012. Uh, we actually, instead of marketing, we don't, I didn't put in a marketing budget. What I did was create a civic engagement arm, which is separate from the editorial team. That civic engagement arm works with government. And they're completely separated? Complete, they're separate from us. They run campaigns with government. So for example, some of the wonderful things we did was you know, climate change. This is, the Philippines starting in 2013 is the third most disaster prone country in the world. So we worked very closely. We worked closely with our uh, Department of Social Welfare and Development in terms of trying to stop stunting hunger. We called it the Hunger Project. We did one, one step better than India's IPaidABribe.com by working with our commission on audit. And we did a crowdfunding of report bribery, right? Because the government itself said, our COA, Commission on Audit, actually said that um, 20%, only 20% of the bribes are reported. So we opened a portal, we built a portal, and then when they reported, we actually, it was the government who responded to them. We enabled government. This is our civic engagement arm. Mm -hmm. So I paid a bribe, you just report it, but you don't get, you don't close the loop on government acting on it. And for a period of time until the Duterte administration came into power, we were doing bottom up anti-corruption campaigns. This is the civic engagement arm again. Okay, while that is happening, and I'll give you a perfect example, super typhoon, Haiyan, which is the way the global community knows it, but for us it was Typhoon Yolanda. In Typhoon Yolanda, one of our MOVE PH is the civic engagement arms. One of our partner was the Secretary of Social Welfare and Development, Dinky Soliman. So she goes to the hardest hit area, and she's there, right? Our, engage, our MOVE PH actually sits in the crisis team because we, we created a panel where people can crowd report uh, any kinds of problems they have in a typhoon. So she goes, but then we have our reporter there. And I don't think this is necessarily a point of pride, but our reporter asks such tough questions that Civic, that Move PH's partner, the secretary, cried. I mean, and they were normal questions, right? When we were there, in this was in Leyte, where the eye of the storm was, Rappler had a satellite, an IP satellite van, but no one else brought satellite phones. I mean, how do you not do that in the middle of a typhoon? Uh, so that was, that's the separation. There's a separate group that worked with government that organizes civil society. The way I thought about it before was that um, Rappler builds communities of action the food we feed our communities is journalism, so it is fact-based, evidence-based. But, but let me stop you it. here, Maria. Uh, today we, 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 we are looking at crisis across the globe, and as yes. journalism, we, we, we are faced with this crisis of reporting today between Ukraine, Iran, what's happening. In that context, where do we draw the line? Uh, uh, how do we uh, uh, answer to the pushback when it comes to sticking to journalism in, in, in conflict zones? I mean, 
first of all, whose definition of journalism? This idea, so I, I have a book coming out in November, how to stand up to a dictator, right? I, I stand for human rights. I stand for press freedom as a journalist. These are not things that I, that I throw out. Um, and this idea of faux objectivity, sorry. Even when I was with CNN, when I was in my 20s and 30s, I was used to think, hello, no one is objective. I'm a five foot two Filipino American. That's the way I will analyze the world. But what is objective is the process of journalism where the reporter has an editor, the editor has a managing editor, and then if it is a particularly sensitive story, you have legal go over it, right? So it is the system of new groups that is frankly quite expensive that technical technology platforms don't have. But you know what? I'm fascinated because you've lived through some tough experiences. You should tell them why this whole idea of drawing the line is also important to you. Well, we, we were talking about this and yes, I am particularly passionate about this because, Syria. I, have, because I covered Syria. Yes, go. And, and in, in Syria, when I did my job and, and my position on Syria was 100% very, very clear against the dictator. But when I was covering on the ground, and it was 2013, beginning of Jabhat al-Nusra, Daesh did not exist yet, but you could see where things were going, and I reported on what I saw. And, and I ended up getting out of Syria, even being with armed militia, I did not feel scared. I felt scared because the social media context got me out of Syria with a fatwa to kill me because I was accused of being against the revolution and against uh, 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 what was happening there. People who were uh, uh, journalists and writers, etc., told me this was not the time to be critical or to say what I was saying. And I raise this point now because really I think we're facing the same okay. issues today. And the way go. What? There is the journalism and there is, and there is where we stand morally and, uh, and, and uh, uh, of course, politically. Well, but the journalism. Yes, yes, yes. The reporting. And I will respond to this exactly the way I responded to when we talked, which is that in the end, the journalist in any conflict must report the facts. That is why this is a battle for facts. And you reported the facts, and it was actually the people who believe the same things you did that attacked you, right? And then, the, where did the attacks happen? On social media, yeah. right? So, so let me, let me t t take that apart. So the first thing is, as a reporter in a conflict zone, regardless of what you think, you report what you see, right? That is why you go to these conflict zones. That's first, regardless of what you think. The way other people interpret it, Frankly, it's not our problem. But, right? but, but the narratives are being set. Oh, yeah. But that, that goes back <laughs> to the, big, the basic problem of social media, right? What spreads fastest? Fear, anger, hate. Who are attacked the most? Women in the Philippines, starting in 2017, this is data, were attacked at least 10 times more than men. Yeah. Because they wanted to stop your reporting. So what did they do? They attacked you. Was it information operations if it was Syria? Maybe, most likely we would have to look at the data. But that is different from how we do our jobs, what we do, um, regardless of what we believe, right? So uh, my, my um, equivalent in the Philippines was, Rappler was one of the first, uh, was the first organization to give then Mayor Duterte a nationwide stage. We, we live streamed all five, there were five candidates for president. He attended our uh, presidential debate. And the people who campaigned against Duterte after he won, then blamed Rappler for his win. That's, bias is in the eye of the beholder. You know, what we did was we were fair, because that is fairness, that is part of the standards and ethics manual. We are transparent about our standards and ethics manuals, about our values. We align with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, with the Philippine Constitution, and we hold those lines. So for others to feel or to, that's an opinion, they can have it. In the old days, when news organizations were in charge of the public sphere, our organizations can get in front of it, and you, a lie couldn't spread a million times to become a fact. Right, so the dangers, I mean, look, the president of Taiwan shared a photo of the Ned, of, of all of us coming together to meet her, right? And then she, I just saw all the attacks against her, including her head being placed on a woman in a bikini, right? Like very salacious, misogynistic 
things. Why is this legal? Why, sorry, now I sound like that. <laughs> but I'm just saying this happens to every reporter and every woman politician. If you're LGBTQ, you, if you were marginalized before in the real world, these attacks get worse in the virtual world. We, we, we don't have much time left, but, but you worked for CNN. Yes. And you, now you champion for independent media. Distribution is much easier for mainstream, and, and getting the message through is much easier for mainstream. Why do you think independent media in this, in this, in this very noisy world uh, because, with, with the technology and algorithms and distribution challenges. Why do you think, why Rappler was, 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 was your choice? And this is why I also co-chaired the Inter International Fund for Public Interest Media, which is to try to get democratic countries to give, to increase 0.3% of ODA to 1% so that we can give it to independent media. My co-chair is the former director general of the BBC and the former president of the New York Times. Okay, so there are two reasons why, and I see that we have 15 seconds left. <laughs> um, uh, reason number one is that independent media doesn't have other ownership. So you just saw the one with business and, uh, and civil society. Well, businesses, corporate media, tends to have a lot more interest. Not to say that you're not independent corporate media. I came from corporate media. But independent media, young, scrappy. Like, why did Rappler stand up? We have no other businesses. We have no other interests to protect. And you know, before we came out with our weaponization of the internet series, I actually asked for board approval because it was exposing something that was insidiously manipulating us behind the scenes. The second thing is corporate media moves too slowly, and this is why we need to move faster. In, when I was managing ABS-CBN, which is the largest network in the Philippines, largest news organization, about 1,000 journalists, and um, it would take, you know, from idea to execution, six months is fast. You know that. Six months is fast. In Rappler, one week, idea to execution. So you can try a lot of things. And that's part of what we need to do in this day and age where, I mean, frankly, not it's not just independent journalism or journalism under attack. Oh, by the way, did we mention that these very same platforms have killed the business model of journalism, yeah. right? Advertising is dead, um, and we must find another sustainable business model. And, and this kind of thing where you have auto Autocracy Inc., and then you have the manipulation of our emotions and minds, we're just the punching bag. And this is part of the reason we need civil society. We cannot do this without you. Well, I, I want to end on a happy. Uh, oh, yeah, on, yeah, we must end happy. <laughs> so we are taking more time, but the last two minutes, okay. how far are we from losing or winning it, in the game? So make it optimistic. <laughs> um, are we going to win? <laughs> it depends on you. We are certainly doing all we can. I'm willing. I mean, I could go to jail for the rest of my life. You have to ask yourself the question, what are you willing to sacrifice? Because this time is when you can be a force for good and silence or apathy becomes a force for evil. How's that? <laughs> Does it work? Please act. We must do something. Oh, yeah, we're live streaming this. You too. <laughs> you must also act. You've got to ask yourself. We're in the last two minutes. And, you know, I think the journalists have done our jobs. Well, we, we, we keep doing We keep jobs. trying. But it's almost like we're just putting our finger in the dam and it's about to collapse. Citizens must step up. And we have to stop being what the tech companies call users or consumers. We must demand integrity of information. I feel bad for governments. They can't govern if you do not have integrity of facts. So let's demand it. Well, uh, I'll, I'll end on that. Thank you so much. Where I'm standing, despite as bleak as the situation is in, in, in the Middle East, um, we're still doing what we can, and it's not game over yet. Not at all. So, not at all. Uh, thank you very much. This has been a fantastic uh, opportunity. Thank you. Thank you.